Hi, everyone. My name is Olivia Mattis. I'm so happy to welcome you to today's program on behalf of the Sousa Mendez Foundation. As many of you know, we've been doing these programs on Sundays uh, since uh, early 2020, so four years now, and we've kept a steady, devoted audience, and it's uh, so heartwarming to know that our programs have an impact on so many. Today, we turn back to our own story. We have sort of our signature program, our signature project, which is the trip that we organize. It's called Journey on the Road to Freedom. And we have held five such programs, uh, such trips uh, over the course of the years. And uh, we will we will do a sixth trip at some point, not this summer, but maybe the next summer or the summer after that. So if Tanya Damertz's film has inspired you to learn more about the trip, please send us an email at info at susamendezfoundation.org and let us know that you're interested. Today we have a, a moderator and three panelists. The moderator is Dr. Shulamit Reinhartz. She is a professor emeritus of sociology at Brandeis University. She's published many books. We are going to have a profile on her upcoming book called Hiding in Holland. We're going to do some sort of a book launch event in June. But she's just published another book called 100 Jewish Brides where you see stories of brides from all over the world. And that one has just come out. So uh, be sure to look into her many publications because she's an authority on every subject, it seems. Oh. So here is Dr. Reinhardt, and she will introduce our speaker. Shula, please take the floor. Thank you. I'm so excited about today's program because I participated in it as well. And I, it's going to be great to see it from so many different perspectives. Thank you, Olivia, for your introduction and for selling my books. Um, today, we have three speakers. They are Tanya Damertz, the woman in the white shirt on the top row, Corinne Zimmerman, whose family seems to have all joined for today's program, and Heidi Amlor, all of whom participated in the trip called the 2023 Journey on the Road to Freedom. Each presenter will speak and show slides for 10 minutes. Corinne is a Jewish woman whose family was saved. Heidi is a non-Jewish Holocaust educator from Maine. And Tanya is a non-Jewish filmmaker from Berlin. I am your moderator, a Jewish woman from Brookline, Massachusetts. We'll start with Corinne. Corinne Zimmerman Maginski, the daughter and granddaughter of recipients of Susan Mendez visas is uh, here with us today. An incredible success story. In June of 1940, 10 members of Corinne's family were rescued from Nazi occupied Europe by the courage and defiance of Aristides de Susan Mendez. It just tells you how much could have been done to save Jews if there had been more people who were consuls like Aristides de Souza Mendes. Corinne participated in this past summer's 2023 Journey on the Road to Freedom tour and is profiled in the film you saw. After college, Corinne taught special education and then moved on to work in the garment industry, like many Jews before her. First for, Nime, for Neiman Marcus as a buyer, and then in the wholesale business as a merchandiser and product development manager. I was very fortunate that Corinne was on this trip because she loved, loaned me some of her beautiful clothing when my suitcase was misplaced for three weeks. Also, um, of course, Heidi loaned me clothes and so did Olivia. So I, I felt beautifully dressed all the time. Now retired, Corinne lives in Florida and Pennsylvania. And next we'll talk about Heidi, Heidi Amlor. 
She is a Holocaust educator and one of the leaders of our trip. Heidi has been a member of the Sousa Mendez Foundation's Educational Initiative Committee since 2019 and currently serves as its chair. Heidi's story is amazing. She became interested in studying and teaching about the Holocaust when she met a survivor, Helen Goldkind, at the US Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. This woman said something that I would like to read to you. Actually, the pe person who wrote what I'm reading is Abraham Joshua Heschel, but they have the same idea. In this hour, we the living are the people of Israel. The tasks begun by our patriarchs and matriarchs and prophets and continued by their descendants are now entrusted to us. We are either the last Jews or those who will hand over the entire past to generations to come. We will either forfeit or enrich the legacy of the ages. And that's what Helen said to Heidi and said, I've told you my story. Now it's your job to pass my, my story on. This chance encounter um, led to Heidi's pursuing a PhD in Holocaust and gender, and excuse me, and genocide studies in 2021 from Gratz College. Dr. Amler's dissertation, of which I've read every single word, is a meticulous study of the way in which Maine's daily newspapers covered the Holocaust. In particular, in contrast to the way national papers, as opposed to local papers, such as the New York Times, covered these events. In the question and answer period, you might ask her a question about that. Heidi is the author of Aristides de Souza Mendes de Amaral e Abranches, colon, diplomat, Christian, savior, and hero. Heidi Amler has been teaching high school for 25 years in Ellsworth, Maine, currently specializing in social studies. She is the kind of teacher we all wish we or our children or our grandchildren had. And now to Tanya, who will be our first speaker. Tanya has been working as a freelance filmmaker for documentaries that are broadly uh, broadcast mainly on the prestigious sites Arte and ZDF. Excuse me one second. Um, she is the mother of two daughters, believe it or not, and a Berlin based freelance journalist and filmmaker. She was born in Hildesheim, Germany, where my grandfather happened to be born, and studied journalism, French, and business administration at the Freie Université of Berlin and at the Université de Montreal. She truly has an international perspective. After her studies, Tanya Demertz worked for nine years at Spiegel TV as a full-time author, initially in news and then for reports and documentaries. Tanya also spent three months in Beijing and Shanghai as a media ambassador for the Robert Bosch Foundation, one of whose purposes is to enable Chinese people and Germans to meet each other. For the, um, I also want to state that Tanya was an active participant in our um, journey and you will see pictures of her which is unusual because usually filmmakers don't include themselves. Um, I think she got a lot out of it. Tanya Damert's films have taken her to East Greenland, to India, to Brazil and to China, and as you will see, to France, Spain, and Portugal. And now I'd like to turn the floor over to Tanya Damert's. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shula, for this nice introduction. Um, I am very grateful and I feel very honored that the Susan Mendes Foundation invited me to this talk. Because, as you know, 
film is not like theater where you get applause in the end or remarks. So I'm looking forward to the questions later on. Uh, yeah, why this film? When my editors uh, called me and asked me whether I would like to do a film about Aristides de Souza Mendes, and then they told me a little bit about the journey on the road to freedom, I said, yes, that sounds interesting. But then I meekly admitted that I'd never heard of this man. And it turned out that it was the same for the whole team. So I started to do some researching and the more I learned about this extraordinary, extraordinary man, the more I was captivated by his biography. And I couldn't believe that hardly anyone here in Germany had ever heard of him. I mean, the man who said to have saved more lives than Oskar Schindler, you could make a whole film about him alone. And then I got involved with the journey and I got in touch with fellow travelers like Marc Cassier. And I was deeply impressed by his story too. I mean, a man who at the age of 73 learns that his name is actually different. And at the age of 88, he uh, sets off in search of his roots. Or Corinne's complex family history, how her mother and her family fled from the Nazis. And here I was faced with the first and the biggest challenge of this film, because how could I squeeze all these interesting stories into half an hour? I was bound by this time limit due to the format of the film. And it seemed impossible to me to tell all these interesting stories into that short time. And something else was new for me because normally I organize my shooting schedules by myself. But on this trip, it was different because there was a detailed program. <laughs> Every day was tightly timed. I mean, the people who were there know that. Every day was tightly timed from 8 a.m. in the morning till 8 p.m. in the evening. And I was tied by this schedule too. Normally we film different scenes from different angles, small actions are repeated, but on this trip, this was impossible. Um, I was aware that a subject like this requires a lot of calm, a lot of empathy and sensitivity, not only from me as a director, but also from our cameraman, Frank, and our sound assistant, Julio. And of course, I didn't want to overburden the participants because I knew that this trip would be an emotional and a physical challenge for them. And I know that filming can be very exhausting. And I thought, oh my God, on top of that all, that might be a burden for them. <laughs> um, so here you see a picture of Corinne Zimmerman. Uh, why did I choose Corinne and Marc Cassier? I've chosen them deliberately because I was looking for fellow travelers who were doing this trip, this journey for the first time. I wanted to go on a journey on discovery with them as they confront childhood memories and long buried family secrets. I wanted to observe what was going on inside them, pain, grief, or relief. And I wanted, I wanted to know what Mark thinks when he enters a synagogue for the first time, knowing that his father was actually Jewish. There is a picture where you can see Mark entering the synagogue here. And, um, but then we ask ourselves how to behave as a camera team. Because, you know, as a film team, you want to be as close as possible. Uh, you want to capture everything. 
and yet not to be intrusive, not to disturb these emotional moments. So when should we withdraw? We often discuss this uh, as a team. You can see our team. <laughs> At the beginning, we somehow attracted more attention than we wanted. We sometimes stood in the way, even though we tried to be in the background. But after a short time, we somehow belonged to the group. We were recognized as part of the group, as part uh, of the group. We traveled with them on the bus, we picked up on their moods, and we could see how the experience was working inside them. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the participants once again for the openness with which they shared the emotions with us. Thank you very much for that. The only time we left the tour group was when we uh, were at the old consulate in Bordeaux, you see here, with Jan de Moncada. We had barely an hour to spare because we had to jump on the bus and move on. But it was a magical moment when we were climbing up the steps with him into the old rooms where history was made back then. And like the participants, we discovered station by station. What I had thought of very carefully beforehand was where I wanted to tell Aristides de Souza Mendes story. Because, you know, all or the development of every single family depends on his development. All the families, all the stories are interwoven. Often a dramatity is created in the editing process. But on this trip, in this film, it was clear that it will be Aristides de Souza Mendes' biography that dictates the dramatity. And that worked out very well. Of course, this film can only be an excerpt from the life of Aristides de Souza Mendes, from the journey and from the experiences the families made. I had to leave a lot of things out and I had to focus. But I have to tell you that hardly any shooting trip, hardly any film has ever moved me as much as this one. I was deeply moved by the pain the families had to deal with. And I remember when I first met Olivia Mattis, she asked me, so Tanya, how many films have you ever made about the Holocaust? And I had to confess, none. So I learned a lot on this journey too, as a filmmaker and as a person. Thank you very much for that. And I'm happy to see Corinne here. Mm -hmm. um, Corinne, it's very nice to meet you. And um, yeah, I have the honor to hand over the floor to you and it's now your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tanya. What, uh, I'm very moved by your presentation. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, this is the story about my maternal family, Fort Gangs, and their, their flee to freedom. In 1935, the Nazi party banned German Jews from citizenship in Germany. On June 12, 1936, the first concentration camp opened, Sachsenhausen. Now I show you a picture. After living in Berlin for 10 years, Abe and Chaya Fortgang, my grandparents, troubled by the increased targeting of the Jewish community, decided it was time to make plans for they and their 
two children, Annette, my mother, and Hannah Helen, their daughter, my aunt, to leave, to flee for safety. So they had to develop strategies in order to do that. Abraham's mother, Rachel, and her three brothers and their spouses and his youngest sister all lived in Antwerp. So Antwerp would be their planned destination. Abe began by applying for Belgian, French, and Dutch visas and a Bolivian passport, an application for citizenship. Chaya began burying family mementos in the backyard of their apartment building, which, by the way, she went back to Berlin in 1951 and uncovered some of those family mementos. June 23rd, 1938, Annette and Hannah Hella boarded a train for Antwerp, Belgium, to live with their grandmother, Rachel Brond Fortgang, and Abraham, Abraham's extended family. Bernard and his pregnant wife, Esther, Moses and his wife, Maria, known to us as Dora, Oscar, who was 19 years old, and the youngest Brand Fortgang family, Clara, who was 14 year old at the time. Fortunately, all three Fort Gang men in Antwerp were in the diamond trade, enabling them to have both diamonds and cash to finance their escape and eventually their future lives. Abe, 1938, Escape Part One. Abe and Chaya slipped out of Germany paying people to smuggle them into Holland through forests and isolated landscapes, eventually landing in Antwerp, Berlin. November 9th and 10th, 1938, Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. September, 1939, Germany invades Poland. May 10th, 1940, Germany invades Belgium. It's time to leave. The Fort Gang journey to freedom continues. Germany is bombing Belgium. The Fort Gang family flees for their lives. The roads were overflowing with cars and people fleeing on foot. The Fort Gangs were on foot. The Germans were dropping bombs and firing at the refugees on the road. At some point on the road to France, Abe put down his suitcases and said, I'm not going any further. They're going to kill us all anyway. Annette and Chaya Hella started crying. My grandmother Chaya turned to the girls and said, continue walking, that their father would follow them. You'll see. A few minutes later, Abe, my grandfather, stood up and decided to follow his family. At night, they sought refuge with local residents. Along their route, they came across a farmer and his very pregnant wife in an empty open truck. Abe bargained with the truck's owner, who agreed to let all 12 Fort Gangs ride in the truck. The flight continued. June 14th, 1940, Germany invades France. With the Luftwaffe bombs falling everywhere and targeting the refugees on the roads, the farmer and his wife decided to hide in a nearby village. Abe buys the truck from the farmer and the family continues their flight to Southern France, Rouen, hoping that President Roosevelt would intervene on France's behalf. Needless to say, that did not happen. Somewhere at that point, Rachel Brand Fortgang, my great grandmother, and her youngest child, Clara Brand Fortgang, age 16 at the time, decided not to continue their flight from the Gestapo. 
They were captured by the Nazis, held in a detention at the Bordeaux synagogue and sent to Auschwitz and Birkenwald where they were exterminated. Aristides de Souza Mendes, Act of Bravery. Here is where the journey to freedom commenced. Based on the bravery of Aristides de Souza Mendes, the Consulate General of the Portuguese embassies in Bordeaux and Bayonne, France, the remaining Fort Gang family joined tens of thousands of other refugees lined up outside the Portuguese embassies in Bordeaux, hoping to gain visas to cross to the French border into Spain and Portugal, the neutral country of Europe. Now you will see Abraham's visa signed by Sousa de Mendez's associate because Sousa de Mendez had fled to Bayonne trying to continue to sign as many visas as possible. Therefore, you see Abe's visa was signed by Jose de Sebra. The next photo is a document by the Jewish Social Services of Porto of brother Bernard, his wife Esther, and their three-month-old daughter, Suzanne, who was born during this journey. Next is a photo of brother Moses and his wife, Maria, known to us as Dora. Abe and family had temporary residence in Curia, Portugal. They left on the ship Niasa in December 23rd, 1940. Abraham, Chaya, Annette, and Hannah Helen boarded the ship Niasa, Niasa, sorry, for the US. The final photograph of our family is pictured on September 2nd, 2012 in Cape Cod at Mark's family home. Annette Fortgang Zimmerman, who is seated in the center of the photograph and her extended family celebrated my 60th birthday. It was a wonderful event. And the final photograph is a photograph of the stone which was given to or donated to the Villa Formosa Museum in honor of the Fort Gang family survivor, which is now engraved in stone at the museum which was the first stop in Portugal for all refugees who were then free, thanks to the humanitarian acts of Aracides de Souza Mendes. I can't tell you how much this has impacted our family. And obviously you've seen uh, that I was unable to keep my tears from flowing during that journey. Knowing that my family, who now uh, the immediate family is 14 members of Annette's survivors, are here because of the bravery of Sousa Mendez. Thank you very much for listening. And I now turn over to Heidi Olmar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Corinne. Um, I'm really honored to be here today. Good afternoon, everyone. So my role with the Susa Mendez Foundation um, is really focused on education. In 2019, I uh, took the journey on the road to freedom um, as a participant, as a teacher. 
And before I left, I would have told you that I knew who Susan Mendez was. I felt fairly comfortable about my knowledge and what I had taught about him. Wasn't on the journey very long when I realized I didn't know anything. So I had the privilege on that first journey in 2019 of traveling with four visa recipient families, one actual visa recipient himself, Andre Diner. Um, and I gained a tremendous amount of knowledge. I had the opportunity to interview each of them. I actually wrote a paper about them. And I realized at the end of that trip um, how much more I needed to add to what I was teaching students um, about um, our hero. So this added to my teaching, added to my knowledge and how I presented this story um, to my students. Upon returning from the journey in 2019, I was contacted by Olivia and Joan Halperin, whose family was also saved by Susa Mendez. And both those ladies asked me if I would join the Educational Initiatives Committee. I'm not sure how I ended up being the chair of it, but I did in one way or another. So at that point, um, we had planned on taking another trip. Um, and then, as you all know, uh, 2020 came and um, everything stopped. <laughs> so while we were all at home, uh, we started to contact um, and connect through Zoom. We grew the Educational Initiatives Committee. Many of the participants from the 2019 trip joined us and we began to brainstorm about how are we going to get this story into the hands of more teachers and this really became our focus. So in a few minutes I'll talk a little bit more about the materials that were created um, both by the committee and then certainly by individuals on the committee, um, but our focus became to reach teachers with this story. So it would not be until 2023 that the journey would take place again. Matthew, if you'd like to start showing the photos. So these photos of the journey in 2023 basically highlight uh, each of the stops that the trip um, takes. And so on the 2023 journey, um, not only did I obviously go, but not as a participant, I was asked to be one of the tour leaders. I was given the opportunity to travel with several more visa recipients and their families. And really, honestly, part of the beauty of this trip is that it changes a little bit each time, depending on who the visa recipient families are. Um, so it actually makes it even more interesting um, each time. So we start here with the journey team in France. Um, the journey team will grow um, when we get into Portugal. Um, but here in France, this is where the trip begins in Bordeaux. On the next slide we see at the park, um, this is where we officially begin the trip. Um, in front of the bust here of um, Sousa Mendez. And this picture, I was able to capture um, the oldest and youngest participants on the trip. We have um, Mark Cassier, who he himself received a visa. And then on the other side, we have Isaac Powell, um, whose great grandmother received a visa. He's the fourth generation in this family. So that was really exciting. And then we were able to lay this gorgeous wreath um, as well um, at, the, at the base of the statue there. So the next photo, um, our next stop is Bayonne, which um, Corinne spoke quite a bit about, um, as well as Tanja. Um, Sousa, uh, Sousa Mendez issued visas here as well. And there's a street here named after him. So our last stop in France is our next photo is um, Hyundai. And we were able to see the bridge. And this is actually the bridge um, that the recipients um, would have crossed. And so a lot of the families were able to stand on this bridge. Um, which was a really um, special moment for them. Um, so on from through Spain, and then we arrive in Portugal, and here is Villar Famoso um, with the Fort Gang family. And this would have been and is the train station that the visa recipients would have seen when we went in 2019. One of the things I remember most about that trip is the visa recipient, Henry Diner, um, who did not have any memory um, because he was three. When we got there, I remember him saying, I remember these colors. Um, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous building. Adjacent to this building is a museum. And um, Corinne showed her last photo of the stone that is there. Um, and the museum is beautiful. It's, it's done really to commemorate um, Sousa Mendez and to recognize the families that he saved. So here's the Kaufman family with their stone um, by the museum. You can see. Um, there, the family there, and then um, from there, there's their stone, much like Corinne's family. And from there, we went to the uh, home of Sousa Mendez. We paid respects to him um, at his grave, which is where we're standing here, and we had the um, 
wonderful experience of many members of the Sousa Mendez family joining us. So we have Antonio um, with the microphone and then Silvario and his lovely family. Um, and then our fearless Portuguese um, team member, Mariana, joined us here as well. And um, from here, we're going to travel to several more spots in Portugal, stopping in Porto at the museum, Holocaust Museum. This is the Eternal Flame. Um, the white that you see on the walls um, were victims. And then Elizabeth um, Ames, who represented the Rosendahl family, is in this picture as well. So one of the highlights of the trip is actually one of our last stops. And this is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that houses the books um, that Susan Mendez and his associates would have written the names in. And it's always so touching for the families to be able to literally see for themselves the names written in there, knowing that their families were saved. And again, um, members of Corinne's family here looking at um, a copy of that um, book. So we had, um, we ended the trip this year with a real treat. Mariana was able to organize um, the opportunity for members of the trip to, to meet the president of Portugal. And here's Mariana and I rubbing elbows with the, with the president, um, Marcelo, who is extremely, extremely gracious. He welcomed us. He actually took the time to go and speak to every single one of us and get our name. Mm -hmm. um, it was really quite thrilling to meet him. Um, and the palace is lovely. Um, so now I want to take a couple of minutes uh, and talk a little bit more about the resources that our educational initiatives group has to offer. So Matthew, if you want to go to our website, and from the projects drop down menu at the top, the second item listed is attention teachers. And this will bring you to this page. Um, you'll see here is the opening slide of a PowerPoint that was created by the Educational Initiatives Committee and it is available free of charge. Um, the PowerPoint was created for use in a classroom. It walks you through the stories of family of the families of Sousa Mendez um, and the journey that they would have gone on. With the PowerPoint is a curricular unit as well that provides both assessment and enrichment for the students. And at the bottom of this page is a place where teachers can request any of our educational materials. Bottom line is this, is that we wanna help. We are here. Um, contact us. Our goal is to share this story as often as possible. We're available to help you in any way that we can in your classroom to hold a workshop. Contact us. We're here to help. Uh, I'd also like to add that you do not have to be a teacher to request the PowerPoint. If you'd like to share this story with your group, in your church, in your synagogue, um, we're here to help you with that. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I really appreciate um, the time that was taken to put this together and to share our resources. Olivia. Great. So audience members, please put your questions into the chat box for our speakers. And while you're doing that, I'm going to tell you about our two upcoming programs for the rest of the month of March. So um, on March 17th, which is St. Patrick's Day, we have our next program. And that's going to be a book talk. This is a brand new book called Whistleblowers. It's a graphic novel. So uh, it's appropriate for your children and grandchildren, middle school and up, middle school, high school, even adults. Um, it's a beautifully drawn graphic novel about four heroes who tried to stop the Holocaust by spreading the word to the US government and the US public about what was going on in Europe during this time. So after today's program, you will get a, a thank you message and there it will have a link to order a signed and inscribed copy of this wonderful graphic novel. So that's our program of March 17th, Whistleblowers. It is a free program. The following week, we will have Shulamit Reinhardt's uh, moderating again. And there we're going to focus on a fascinating figure, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. He was one of the leaders of the US civil rights movement. He was always there in the front lines, right there with Martin Luther King. He was a pioneer of interfaith dialogue, was very involved in Vatican II, 
and so much else. So right now we're going to see a little trailer of the new film on Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. The halls are close to your church. The march will not continue. On the front lines of the historic Civil Rights March in Selma, Alabama, standing along with Martin Luther King Jr. is one of the most remarkable religious figures of the 20th century, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. I think they became friends, but more than friends, they became brothers. He was the authority on the prophets, but on this occasion, he was the prophet. <laughs> Abraham Heschel is plucked from the fire of the Holocaust that will take the life of his mother and sisters. And in 1940, he arrives in America. And he's already come out of this magnificent dynasty of rabbis that go back for centuries. He's part of a dynastic royalty. He lived in excruciating ways with the reality that as the world and the family he grew up in was destroyed in Europe, most of the world was in fact indifferent. Remember, in a free society, some are guilty, but all are responsible. Over the next three decades, Heschel fights indifference through his vision of a God who seeks to partner with humanity. To be in real connection to God was to be in awe and radical amazement at the universe that God had created. And his love for the prophets of the Hebrew Bible who dare speak truth to power. And Heschel taught that each of us has a choice to make. What side of history do we ultimately want to land on? He was kind of a theological Hemingway. He wrote in short, pithy aphorisms of enormous power. Heschel plays a pivotal role in reshaping the contentious relationship between Catholics and Jews. But I also have to remind them that my being Jewish is so sacred to me that I am ready to die for it and he risks being in the forefront of the protests against what he believes is an immoral war in Vietnam. My father was attacked for so many of the public positions that he took. My father wouldn't be quiet. No one could silence him. I am an optimist against my better judgment. And somehow, I believe in God. And somehow, I believe and am convinced that he will have mercy and pity more than we deserve. So I hope that you will sign up for these two programs and our further programs to come. So right now I'm turning the floor back to Shulamit who will, uh, who will monitor the question and answer portion of our program. Go ahead, Shulamit. Okay, I am trying to get onto the chat here. Um, there's a lot of messages of thanks and you know gratitude to the wonderful speakers. I must say, to a woman, you were great, uh, all of you. And um, you're all like great teachers. Um, and so perhaps I will just start with some questions of my own. So my question is, to any of the three of you, why did Susan Mendes do this? We call him a uh, righteous man. He's, he has become a righteous Gentile, according to Yad Vashem. But why did, how did he go about doing this? And why did he do it? So um, would anyone like to answer that? To the best of your ability. Heidi, you're always willing to <laughs> take a chance. Go for it. I think it, it's 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 two things. Um, number one, he was a human who saw a great need, um, and he decided that he was the person who could, at least in part, fill that need. Um, but I also think that his faith had a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, of his his famous quotes talking about that he would rather be you know with God against man than with man against God um, and for those of you and I think probably most of us do know the story of Sousa Mendes he struggled with this he struggled with this he knew he knew that this was going to possibly end his career 
Um, but he knew he also had to do the right thing. And I think a lot of times that myself included, um, and you know, he is a hero, but he also was a man. And I think sometimes we lose sight that we also have the ability um, to make decisions like Susan Mendes did, simply do the right thing when it's right in front of us. So Heidi, there's a question. When you teach high schoolers, what is the one question that they all seem to ask? Thank you, Olivia. Uh, I had saw that in the chat before and I was thinking about it. And I think there's actually two. The first question that most high schoolers ask when I teach about the Holocaust is why the Jews? They don't understand. Um, what did they, and it's often phrased, what did the Jews do that, that created this? Um, and I usually solve that or at least try to solve it. And I have to go back, honestly, quite a ways in history. Um, when I teach about the Holocaust and I have a separate class that I teach about the Holocaust, but I also teach world history, um, I actually start with Abraham and I go up to modern times. Um, I really find it is very, very important for students to, to have a grasp of who are the Jews, who were the Jews, who are the Jews today, um, and, and what's the deal? And then I always make sure that I emphasize that they actually didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> they haven't done anything. Um, and then the other question that usually students ask, it's about halfway through my Holocaust class, is why didn't they just leave? Why didn't they just pick up and leave? Um, and so then again, that takes more explanation as well. Um, thank you. And a question here for Tanya. Tanya, was there anything in your film that you wanted to put in, but that you had to omit because there just wasn't the time in the room? Oh, a lot. <laughs> I, I thought in, at the beginning, I thought I had to do like three hours or something like that. For sure. I mean, for example, I had to leave a whole story out. I wanted to tell the story, for example, of Cookie Fisher, who is a very interesting character. And um, I filmed her a lot, I interviewed her a lot. I, I loved her story, but the only reason that it didn't appear in the film is that we hadn't had enough time. And I, I felt obliged to tell one story as a whole and not to like uh, have one and one and one and to don't understand all these stories. So this, for example, was one thing. And I would have loved to tell more about the um all the the Sousa Mendes um relatives and, and and his story too I mean I only I, I Sousa Mendes biography is is very shortly told in the film so this is another example and I could mention a lot more I I do have some of the other questions here um I want to say also that these people who did receive a visa from Susan and Mendes were so fortunate vis-a-vis -vis other people who were so close to getting it, but didn't. My own grandparents were in a concentration camp in France at the bottom of the Pyrenees Mountains, the mountains that the uh, Susan Mendes visa recipients were able to cross, but my, those people, my grandparents could not get out of the concentration camp called Gorse. And so they didn't make it. It was so unusual to find uh, consuls who would do this for anybody. Um, there's a person here uh, who asked this question, which comes from the Jewish Fellowship of Hemlock. I don't know what that is, but the Hemlock Society is one in which I think advocates people taking their own lives when they, not, that's wrong, Corinne, you want to tell yeah, me? Yeah, it's the Jewish Fellowship um, Synagogue of Hemlock Farms in Hawley, Pennsylvania. Well, I couldn't have been further off because <laughs> I didn't say that. Um, but this person, thank you for correcting me, um, wrote that that person wondered why people fled to Portugal especially since Spain was fascist and Portugal was not neutral. Why did they choose Portugal? Does anyone want to address that? Well, Portugal was neutral. Was neutral. P Portugal oh, was neutral. And what did neutral mean? It didn't mean that they weren't fascists there, but it meant that Germany did not invade them. 
And because Germany did not invade Portugal, as it did other countries that wanted to be called neutral, like Holland, but since Hitler did not invade Portugal, no Jews were killed in Portugal during the Holocaust. And we can't just attribute this to the fact that Germany didn't invade, because in most countries, it was not just the Germans who were killing the Jews, but wherever the Germans were, the, the bystanders, the citizens of those countries uh, also did that. Why else do you think there was a desire to go to Portugal in order to flee? Well, clearly it was also a port and in a port you can then take a ship to somewhere. It's about as far away as you can get, yeah. right? And uh, it was known as a place in which you could uh, get out of the country to Morocco, to um, the United States, et cetera. I think all of these questions, none of us really have the, the knowledge of being there first person, of experiencing any of this first person and looking at it as, at, as the perspective, at the perspective of either a, a next generation or um, somebody who doesn't have the family history. There are too many questions that will never be answered. Right. And in, I, I wanted to go back to uh, Shulamay's question about why or what, what impact um, Sousa de Mendez had, how he got to the point to make up his mind. I think in every generation, and we certainly see it in our current generation, there needs to be a brave person who steps up and makes the right decision of how to save whatever the circumstances are, whether it's the right decision in, in our government, casting aside all their pre, um, their, their thoughts or their previous, um, learnings that they stand up and do the right thing. And there aren't enough people who do that so that we have to celebrate those who put themselves last and the rest of the world first. He's the exceptional man. And right. there are such people, they're called tzaddikim in every generation. And it is thought that because there are 36 so they came in a generation, the world is saved. I got three candidates right here. Okay, <laughs> Olivia. Thank you all for a beautiful hour, for your beautiful film, Tanya, that moved us all so much. It was a joy to have you on the trip. And thank you, Shulamit, for moderating. Thank you to our audience. See you all next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. Be well. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>